Amen. It was only, I think it was only one slide, that last song. Yeah, turn your eyes. Yeah, the chorus. Amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look, look full in his wonderful face. And listen, because this is the effect that the gospel message, if it's having its way in your heart and life, this is what should be taking place. You want to gauge your Christianity? You want to gauge your walk with God? That's what should be taking place. The things of the earth should grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. I mean, that's a measuring line right there. You really can't get much clearer than that. That's what should be taking place if you're truly walking in a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Because I'm here to tell you that he is more than just a fictional character in a book. Do you understand what I'm saying? you got to understand that to most people, um, this person, Jesus, who he is, he's really nothing more than a character that's written in a book, no more than Superman or Hercules or this one or that one. And I'm even talking about a bunch of church folk here today. That's the fact of the matter. The reality in a lot of church people's lives is that Jesus is nothing more than a fictional character that they hear about, but they've never really been introduced to him. They've never met him on a personal, one-on-one, -on -one, intimate level. That's why sometimes when... when People will see maybe the way that you worship the Lord and the way that you weep and the way that you cry and, and they can't understand it. Um, chances are they might have never encountered him like you've encountered him. Don't look down upon them for that. Thank, be thankful that you've yeah. encountered him that way. It's very important. Amen. I'm so thankful that I met the Lord. I'm so thankful for what he's done in my life. Uh, I just had a, my fifth child two days ago. Amen. The, yeah, praise the Lord. I was just informed that uh, his, his stomach was upset, but he finally pooped again, so he's good. <laughs> he, he's pooping and he's eating, so that's a good thing. He's a, he's a little bit thing, but the Lord ha has blessed me. And, and um, one of the things that I'm looking forward to, Brother Vince, is, is spending the rest of my life with the opportunity. I was telling Matt about this earlier, and I've been sharing this. I talked to uh, Ross Kibito earlier on the phone, and um, I talked to Luke on the phone. Um, and, and this is one of the things that's really been in my heart is that I get the opportunity now where I've messed up so much in the past. I get this opportunity to take this little child that the Lord has blessed me with and show him what it's like to be a man of God. Amen. Not to tell him what it's like, not to tell him that he should live for God or that he should serve God or that he should go to church or that he should obey the word of God. No, but rather that I get the opportunity for the rest of my life that the Lord will bless me with to show him what it means to be a godly husband and a godly father. And I'm here to tell you that both of those things are equally important as a father and as a husband. If you're going to serve God, it's important that you be a godly husband and a godly father. That the view that you show your children is not one-sided, which is actually going to take me right into the message that I, I want to preach tonight. Uh, I want to uh, preach a message, and I, and I titled it simply, God versus Man. Which side am I on? God versus man, which side am I on? Um, I come here under the presupposition that we are all Christians in here tonight, that we have all been born again, that we have all chosen to walk with the Lord. Um, so understand that when I speak tonight, the things that I say, I, I am saying to what I presume to be believers, to people that have been born again. I am here tonight as someone who has been called by the Spirit of God to bring forth a word 
to his body, amen, to his church. I don't look at the church as a hospital for sinners because those that are in the church have been called out. They are the ecclesia, the called out ones. They are the ones that were lost, but now they're found. Do you understand what I'm saying? So now we are in a place where we've been brought together to be built, to be edified, to be built up by the fivefold ministry as they preach and teach the word, as they cause you to set your eyes upon Jesus. Because that's the work of the ministry, to constantly be causing you to set your eyes upon Jesus, right, so that you can learn to surrender to Jesus. Because I'm not here to get you to surrender to me or to Matt or to the Crossway ministry or to any other person, but I, I would that you would surrender your life to Jesus Amen. and that you would allow him to build you and to create you into the bride that he wants you to be. And don't worry, we got scriptures. I want to I read a definition real, qu real quick. Uh, Humanism. Has anybody ever heard that word, humanism? Humanism, what is it? It's an outlook or system of thought attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. Humanist beliefs stress the potential value and goodness of human beings. Let me, let me read that again. Humanist beliefs stress the potential value and goodness of human beings, emphasize common human needs, and seek solely rational ways of solving human problems. Well, well why are you talking about humanism? I do believe that the biggest threat to the church since the fall is the problem of humanism. It's the, the problem of a, a mind that has been tainted by sinful humans. I, I want to tell you something really quick about yourself. In and of yourself, left alone, without the grace of God, every single one of you sitting here under my voice, and including the person that the voice comes from, you are sinful, you are evil, you are wicked, Amen. That's the word of God. That's not me telling you something that I think. I'm telling you what the word of God says. And throughout my life, God has proven this very fact to me. That in and of, my, of myself, I am without him a reprobate. I am lost and I am undone. I do not need the world or the devil to entice me to enjoy sin because in and of my sinful self, I love sin. That is a fact. Not me, preacher. Well, you're already a liar. In and of yourself, outside of the grace of God, without the grace of God moving upon your heart, if he, listen, if he would restrain his grace from your heart at this very instant, you would not only be what you were, but you would be ten times worse than what you were before. But humanism says it's different. And humanism has infiltrated the church. And that, let me, it, it really didn't infiltrate the church. It's always been here. It, it's always been here. I, I want to give you all, and, and I'm preaching this, I, I'm bringing this. I want you to understand that I don't do this. Um, I was praying back there, and I said, Lord, I don't mind. I, I don't mind being used as a mouthpiece of offense for you. But, Lord, don't let me be offensive to your people. So I don't stand up here just hoping to be offensive to people, but I do stand up here with a warning to the church that Christ is building, to the bride that he's building to himself, that you must be vigilant. Amen, that we're in a battlefield, that, that we're in a war. And your adversary, the devil, he roameth about seeking whom he may devour. And you've got to understand that you've got the, the enemy here, the, the devil, Satan, all his minions, demon spirits and demonic forces and powers and all of these things coming at you every single day through your television, through your radio, through your 
children, through your parents, through your friends, through your co-workers. You've got the world system pulling at you and grabbing at you. But not only that, you've got the flesh. The fact that the sinful nature is still there and you have a fallen flesh. Now one day, praise God, the word of God says that the corruptible shall put on the incorruptible and the mortal shall put on the immortal. One day I'm going to shed this old chubby body, Matt, and it's all the sin that's in it is going to be gone and I'm going to get a glorified body. But until then, we are pressed from all around. We're oppressed from the world. We're oppressed from the devil. We're oppressed from the flesh. And they're all doing our best, their best to get us to oppose the things of God. Now, one of our big problems is, is we are one-sided. We like to look at Jesus one-sided. We like to look at God as love. And he is, and thank God for his love. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his grace. Thank God that in December... And I, and I love to share this because it's so important with what God has done in my life that in December, just a few months ago, that leading up to December, right before that point, that my mind was fixed on how can I fill my next lustful desire? What can I do to, to fill my next lustful, filthy desire, and who am I going to do it with? That's the fact. That's the truth. That's what my mind was on. But then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just showed up one day. He showed up and He convicted my heart. And I began to see His goodness. And I, and I began to see, and all of a sudden, my, 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 my sight was clear again. And I, and I began to look back at the last six years and think, oh my God, what have you done? And I looked and I, and I see it and I can see a path of destruction in my life for the last six, seven years where I've lost my family, my, my, my three children. I, I, I didn't lose them that they're dead, but I, I lost six and a half years to lead them into things of God because I was fooled and confused by the world, the devil, but most of all by this sinful flesh that I was led astray and my own desires became more important than everything else that was around me. And let me tell you something, the world, the flesh, and the devil, they were more than happy to let me think that I was doing what was best for me. And they were more than happy to tell me that I really needed to do it. It was best for my children because what good am I to them if I'm not happy? Humanism, self-desires, needs, wants, You've heard, you've heard it said, and you've probably said it before. Well, you're no good to your kids if you're not happy. You're, you're just not going to do them any good if you're not happy. Where in the Word of God does it say that life is about being happy all the time? Give me a scripture that says life is all about you're just going to be happy and everything is going to be okay. But yet we look at our Savior as he lived to die. The very purpose that he came for was to live a spotless life and then to be led to Calvary where he would give his life, where he would take the judgment of sin upon him. Do you understand that that's what he did? For you and I, he took the judgment of sin upon his flesh. The word of God says that God condemned sin in the flesh, and he did that upon his son. Yet we think that we're just going to run through this life and everything is all about you and I being happy and fulfilling our own selfish needs and our own selfish desires. And that's what God really wants for our life. It's humanism and it's against the things of God. It's against the plan of God. Yes, God is love, but the word of God also says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated That's not scriptures that I made up. As a matter of fact, I got them. Can we go to uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 1? Because I want to give you all something to think about. It's important that you as an individual, when you get into the Word of God, that you don't go into the Word of God with any predeterminations about what you want God's Word to say to you. You ought to go into the Word of God asking God 
Lord, do not let me bring my own thoughts and ideas into your word. Rather, Lord, you teach me what you're saying in your word. Unfortunately, we like to read things that get hard. And in our own humanistic ways, we think, well, surely God is not saying that. So what is he really saying here? Romans chapter 9 in verse 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Next verse. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. I want you to just stop right there and really understand that for a minute. Those that are of the flesh, these are not the children of the God. We, we've said it here many times. I've said it. Matt said it. We've got to understand that not everyone is a child of God. We live in a world, we go to work, and we, we deal with people, and they think that just because they say God or just because they mention God or just because they wear a cross or they have a shirt that says blessed and highly favored and, and this and that, that they are too the children of God. Don't you know that we are all the children of God? But this is not true. That is humanism, and that is against the word of God. The truth of the matter is, is that every single human being that's ever been born into this earth after Adam, which is everybody besides Eve, for he and, and Eve were created, but everyone that's ever been born of Adam came out as a son or daughter of the enemy, a child of the flesh. My little sweet little two-year-old, my two-year-old, my little sweet year old, two, two, two-day-old, I sat in the hospital just a couple of days ago as I was looking, he's so beautiful. I don't want to tell y'all how beautiful he is because I don't want to make y'all feel bad about y'all's kids. <laughs> but he, he's so precious. Amen. And, and I was sitting there and I used my little two-year-old as an opportunity to witness as I started talking about, look how beautiful he is. But don't you know that at his heart he's wicked and he's evil. He is depraved and he's fallen and he's undone. And if he lives long enough... Hopefully, I'll have shown him how to surrender his heart and life to the Lord so that he can be born again of the seed of God, so that he can be a child of God, so that he would not be a child of the flesh. You see, because the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Next verse. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil. Oh, man, we could mess, mess up some theology right here, but I'm not going to do it because I want to get to a point. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Next verse. What shall we say then? And I'm going to stop at this verse. Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Now let me tell you something about those verses. Because some of these verses right here is verses that a lot of y'all would not want to talk about. Because they would cause you to really start to squirm a little bit about what you're going to do with some of the stuff that's being said. And I'm not trying to cause you to lean one way or another. I'm just saying sometimes we need to just let the, the Word of God talk instead of trying to make it talk to us how we want it to talk. 
And what is important to understand about these verses is, number one, the flesh. Those that are of the flesh are not the children of God. It's only the seed of the promise. Amen. Those that came through Isaac. I want to ask you, have you been born of Christ? Have you been born again of the incorruptible seed? For if you have, then you're of the seed of promise, and you should no longer be acting like a child of the flesh. Okay? There should be something that looks different. You should look like a spiritual child and not a child of the flesh. The next thing we see right here, and, and this is what is something that the Lord has showed me for a long time. Man, I'm almost out of time already. Um, for a long time is, is that we, as the church, have brought it upon ourselves. We've, we've decided that it is us. Um, and I used this word the other, the other day in Bible study. And hey, listen, Sunday's at 5. It's 5 we have Bible studies. Huh? Sunday at 5, man, we have some good Bible studies. We have, a, we have some good fellowship. Um, there's only a few of us that come. But, hey, if y'all never not doing anything, y'all are more than welcome to show up. It's a good time. Right, But I had said this the other day that we have this, this thought that God has called us to be his public relationists. The, the church has adopted the idea because of humanism that we are God's public relationists to the world. That we are here to make God more acceptable to the world. We're here to soften him up and make him look uh, in a way that the world would accept him. And I'm here to tell you, I'm, I'm willing to bet that we're all guilty. I've done it before. I remember a specific time years ago standing in my front yard talking to uh, someone about the Lord. And instead of talking to him about how Jesus had set me free from sin, I began to talk to him about how God had blessed me financially. And he, he had blessed me financially. It wasn't a lie. Well, looking back now, it might not have been him. But instead of talking to him about the hard thing, I decided, ah, let me make God more appealing to him. I'm, I'm, I know I'm not the only one that's guilty of that. I know that. But the truth is we've all done it. Because that's what the flesh wants to do. The flesh wants to make God more appealing. But I've got news for you, church. I've got news for you, world. And if you happen to be sitting in here today and you're not born again, I've got news for you. God is not on trial. Amen. God is not on trial for whether or not you'll accept who he is and what he does. If you don't like what that says about God, that's your problem. That's not his if that's who he says he is, it's who he is. And it's not for you to decide that you need to change it and soften it up for people to accept and to agree with. Something I was thinking about today, I thought about all these celebrities that are saved. I thought about a lot of, I mean, you got producers that are saved that make some of the raunchiest TV movies I've ever seen, and all they talk about is how saved they are, and they get on platforms, and they, they preach and, and stuff like this, but then the movies they make are raunchy, and it's almost porn with clothes on. But we see a situation like that, and we get all giddy over a celebrity who says the name of Jesus. And not because we're happy that a soul got saved. No, but because we think that he accepting Jesus might make Jesus look cool. Come on. I hate to break it to you. I don't need a celebrity to make Jesus cool for me. Because the truth of the matter is, is everything that I thought cool was, Jesus wasn't. Everything that I thought that was cool about the world, my Savior is none of those things. He's none of those things. He's not here to cause you to accept him for what he came to do or for what he didn't come to be. He's here, and he's putting an ultimatum out, and he's saying, I love you. I desire you. I want to be with you. Amen. But these are, these are the stipulations. This is the way that it's going to be, and it's really not debatable. It's not 
up for debate. We could go to Hebrews chapter 12 real quick, verse 14, and just kind of look at that as well. And it's going to be quick because I just want to verify what I just said about this man Esau. Hebrews, he said, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently lest any man fell of the grace of God. What do you mean I could fell of the grace of God? You absolutely can Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance. Look at this. This is, this is hard though he sought it carefully with tears. He cried. He wept. I'm not going to the next verse. You can stay there. He cried, and he wept. He sought repentance, Brother Jeremy, but he couldn't find it. There was none to be found. Oh, no, not my God. Well, maybe not your God. But my question is, which God is your God? Because the God of the Bible, now this is something you have to determine for yourself. Is this the Word of God? Is every book in between these pages, the 66 books that were written here by men of old as the Spirit of God breathed upon them, is this really God-breathed? God inspired the Word of God. That's a determination that only you can really make for yourself if you really truly believe that what's in between these pages is the Word of God. And if it is, then listen to me, church. You're going to have to make a daily determination. You're going to have to make a de daily determination that you're not going to walk carnally minded but that you're going to walk spiritually minded well what do you mean well how do I do that well one of the biggest ways that you do that number one you need to get to know the word of God you need to know what God says about himself Amen. you've got to know what he says about himself because there's too many preachers out there telling you things about God that God never said about himself so many things that, that you hear, that you see. And, and it, it's why years ago I, I seen a preacher on television and not saying names or anything like that. I just want to throw this out there. It's because of the, car, it's the carnal nature of man that opposes the things of God. Right, And if you're not going to walk spiritually minded, if you're not going to get to know the word of God and what God says about himself, then what's going to happen is you're going to see somebody talking really sweet and really kind and really nice with a big smile on their face, and you're going to think, well, surely they must love because of how their tone of voice is, and you'll hear somebody like me that's red in the face and yelling, and their, their, their voice is, is, is just sounding like I might be angry or something, but the truth of the matter is, is I'm, I'm angry at the people that are willing to lie and not tell the truth about who God is that causes people to stumble and to get messed up. And I'm hurt for the people of God who do not know the word of God and what God says about himself. And they allow the world, the devil, and the flesh to influence what they think about God. So then they hear a preacher like Matt weeping and crying and, and screaming from the rooftops or someone like me and they think well he's just critical and he's just trying to say bad things about no sometimes we're just trying to warn you that there's a real enemy out there that there's a real world system out there that there's an enemy on the inside of you and they're encompassed you about and they're trying to do everything that they can to cause you to see God for less than what he is it's a humanistic view trying to, to 
bring man up to who God is, but the only way to do that is to bring God down to who man is. I watched the preacher as the, it was Larry King asked him, is Jesus the only way to heaven? I mean, I know without a doubt that there's nobody in here that would say opposite of that. But every single person in this room at one time or another has asked themselves, is Jesus really the only way? Is, is he really the only way? Is it really, is it, maybe I'm alone, maybe I'm the only one. I don't think I am though. Because that's what our flesh does. Our flesh will tell us surely, look at all these people out here. And you think you have the only way? And Larry King asked the preacher, is, is Jesus really the only way? And he said, I'm talking about a preacher. Uh, well, Larry, you see, uh, well, I've seen Buddhists, and they love God. So who am I to say that Jesus is the only way? The world, the devil, the flesh twisting and messing things up. The carnal man that's at enmity with the things of God, that's at enmity with the plan of God. If we were to go, and I'm not, because I've got so many scriptures that I could preach for the next three hours. If one of y'all says amen, I'm going to go. <laughs> if we were to go to the book of Genesis chapter 3 and we looked at the fall, we noticed something, and this is something that the Lord revealed to me years and years ago, and I never really, I didn't feel like I heard a lot of people talk about it growing up. But in Genesis chapter 3, we know the story. God made a man, he made a woman. I said he made a man, and he made a woman, and that's what he made. The book of Ephesians tells us why that marriage bonded, and the first marriage, the first message I preached here when I, when, uh, I got to preach um, a few months back was about that um, God's way, right? The bride of Christ. And, and he showed us how that there was something in the marriage, in the family unit. The word of God in the book of Ephesians, I believe it's chapter 4 or chapter 5, he says that, that this marriage between an, a man and a woman is the mystery of Christ in his church. Oh, it's so deep. And it's so beautiful. But God made this man and this woman, and we know the story. The serpent was more subtle, and he came, and he came in, and he slithered in, or he, actually he walked in, because it sounds like, according to Genesis, that the serpent had legs, that he actually walked, right? I'm, I think he was a dragon. That's what I think. That's just my personal opinion. That's a little commentary. I won't even charge y'all for that. I think that's where we get the myths of dragons from. Ain't saying it's right, ain't saying it's wrong, it's irrelevant, whatever it is. The, the serpent came in and he talked, right? And he began to talk to Adam and Eve. And, and uh, it, it, it appears that, obviously, serpents, these things could talk. It, I, Eve didn't freak out. She didn't run away. The serpent began to talk. And he tricked her. He twisted up God's word and he tricked her. And the word of God says that she saw the, the fruit of the tree and saw that it was good for food. She saw that it was good for food, and she partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let me read it. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, humanism, she saw that it was good to partake of, and that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And guess what happened, and we're not going to go any more into that story. When her husband ate of that tree, humanity died. Right there. Humanity. How old did Adam live to be? 900-something years. He lived a long time. He lived a lot longer physically than any of us in here are going to live. Thank God. Because I wouldn't want to live to be seven, eight, nine hundred 900 years old. 
Sometimes I wake up and I'm like, Lord, let's go, man. I'm ready. Let's do this thing. I'm ready to get out of here. I'm tired. Right? But from that day he, that he ate, as soon as Adam ate, that was it. The human race became dead in their sin and their trespass. And what we see a lot of is that we like to really call out evil. And we like to focus on evil. But the deadliest part, the, the deadly part of that tree for Eve was that it looked good. It looked good for food. It looked good. And it was going to make her wise. And the enemy has not changed his tactics. If we, if we were to fast forward to the Tower of Babel, we would see after the flood, right, when uh, God had told Noah, go forth and, and, and replenish the earth, scatter them abroad and pre- pre- replenish the earth. And we saw humanity come together, and, and they would come together, and God would say, let us go down and see what it is that man is doing. And he would come down, and, and, and the Godhead would make the statement, now they're all together, and... If we don't scatter them, there's nothing that they can't accomplish is basically what was taking place. What were they doing? What was going on? Well, we could get into the depths of it, but the real thing that was going on is that the fleshly mind, the carnal man, controlled by the sinful nature, was getting ready to start working on this world system along with the influence of the enemy, Right, And they were in opposition to God's plan. What was God's plan? God's plan was to call a man named Abraham. And through Abraham, he would bring forth a nation. And through this nation, he would bring forth a seed. Amen. This seed, this singular, this seed, Christ. And through Christ, he would redeem all of mankind. And they were opposed to the plan of God. So God scattered them. That's where we see people coming forth in different colors, different languages, different tribes, all of these things. That's why we're not all the same color, and that's why we're not all the the same uh, language and this and that. It's not because uh, some of us evolved out of uh, Baya Blue and some of us evolved out of the ocean. (laughs) It's nothing to do with any of that. It's because that's what God did, because he had a plan. And mankind left in and of himself would do anything that it can to destroy that plan. Now we're going to get into my message. I want to go to the book of Matthew chapter 16 in verse 13. And I'm going to try to wrap this up very quick. I told you I had a lot of scriptures, but I'm still being mindful of understanding that. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say Elias. And others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say you that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which which are in heaven. Now, the question for all of humanity is this. When you look at Jesus... Who is he? Who is he to you? Not who is he yesterday, and not even who is he tomorrow, but who is he right now to you in your life? Who is this man, Jesus? And Peter gave the only real answer, the answer that every single person that's ever walked will one day give, whether they do it here Or they do it on the other side, but they will answer. And they will call him the Christ, the Son of the living God. They will call him the Lord of lords and the King of kings. That's going to happen. Whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, whatever your thought about that is, it really doesn't matter. Because that's what's going to take place. 
Right? So this response we see, it came by revelation of God the Father. That's another thing we've got to understand. That this is something that flesh and blood cannot reveal to you. You dumbing down Jesus to your neighbor is not going to reveal to them who he is. Not going to help one bit. You performing a miracle, if you were capable, is not going to influence them on who Jesus is. Well, how can you say that, preacher? Well, look, they crucified him in the midst of all he was doing was miracles. He was raising the dead. He was taking a fish and just poke, poke, poke. Who does that? Have you, have, Mike, you from Pierre Park, bro. They fish all the time over there, I do. Have you ever seen any of those cats grab a fish and just begin to pass it out? Because it don't happen. It's not natural. It defies everything. Natural. But yet they've seen it with their own two eyes. And it didn't convince them. This is a revelation that comes from God the Father to a heart that is in a place that has been broken down and crushed, that can truly see itself for who it is, lost and undone, a sinful man or woman who in and of themselves is on their way to a devil's hell, but that God would reach down and that he would infuse them with his very life, that there's nothing... Lord, there's nothing. That's where I came to. I came to a place that I looked at this person and I I said, you're a wretch and you're undone and you're wicked and every single thing that you put your hands to, it crumbles before you. And God said, you've finally seen what I've been trying to show you. And he revealed his son to me as the Savior the Messiah, the one who would take a sinful, wretched, lustful, evil man and breathe life into him and lift him up and uphold him in his hand. And I can walk around the days not captivated by lust as I see every single female that walks around me, not thinking of what it would like. Can I be real? Can I be honest? Not overtaken with the thoughts of what? how can I get her to notice me and talk to me and have my way with her. I don't live like that anymore only because I have been brought to a place of brokenness, a place of despair where I was able to see myself for what I truly was, not because I needed more money, Not because I needed this or that. No, but because I needed life that I did not have. And that is the true Jesus. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Not you, Esau. You love your flesh and you love your sin and it's what you want, then you can have it. Take it and keep it. Do what you want to do with it. And if you get lucky, maybe it'll destroy you to the place that you can see that you need a Savior. But that's the only way. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. But humanism says, we don't want that Jesus. John 6, 44 says, no one can come to me. We can stay right here. Let's not switch. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Actually, as a matter of fact, let's go to Romans 3.10. I still got a few minutes. Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Read that real good. There is none. No, no, the next one. My bad, I'm sorry. Uh, 11, 11. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after 
God. I want you to understand that. Jesus told uh, Simon Peter, he said, my father revealed this to you. Flesh and bone didn't reveal this. Jesus would say in, in John 6, what I had just read a minute ago, that no man comes to the Son except the Father draws him. Right here we see that, that no one seeks after God. There is not one single individual on the face of this earth. I'm here to tell you that Abraham wasn't even seeking after God when God sought after him. Do you hear what I'm saying? He might have been seeking after some God, but he wasn't seeking after the true God. In December when God showed up, I wasn't seeking him. I was seeking uh, more vodka. Maybe a little drugs here and there. Another woman. I was seeking all kind of stuff, but it wasn't God, but he showed up and he sought me with his convicting power. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Next verse. Oh, you good? They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. They're no good to me. They are of no profit. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open, open grave. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps, of snakes, of vipers is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and of bitterness. That's what we are. I heard the preacher say it the other day, and I've been using it ever since. That little, that little two-day-old I got over there is nothing more than a viper in a diaper. If he could, listen to what I'm saying, and I believe this with all my heart about children, about little babies. If they were big enough and strong enough, they would kill us if they could when we make them angry. Have you ever seen one throw a tantrum? Stiffen up their little bodies and scream and yell? Now just think, if that was a full-grown man with that mind, what they would do. Full, full of sin, full of wickedness. Oh, I, know, I know it's not y'all babies, it's only mine. But that's the truth. I mean, you don't have to teach a kid to be bad. You got to teach them to be good. You don't have to teach them to tell a lie. You got to teach them to tell the truth. It's because there's something on the inside of us. We're depraved and we're undone and we're all seeking about our own direction, our own way, self-preservation. What can make my life better? Can we go back to Matthew chapter 16, back to uh, verse number 17, 18? And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter, the very disciple who just a few verses before had the revelation that you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, you're the Son. Listen to what I'm saying. You're the Christ. You're the one. You're the son of the living God. Jesus asked him, who do you think I am? You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, okay, you've answered good, Peter. My father revealed this to you. Then he goes on to reveal to Peter the cross. And Peter says, Peter took, took Jesus and began to rebuke him, saying, be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. And we'll look at what Jesus said. I want to I really dig into this. But he turned and said unto Peter, he said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. He told Peter, 
Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God. And let's stay on this verse. But those that be of men. We see three people in this verse. There are three groups of people. Well, I guess Satan is not a people, is he? See different, let's say entities. We see three different entities. Entities, we see Peter, the very one who just had the revelation that Jesus is the Christ, he's the Son of God. Right? And then we see Peter, Jesus calling Peter Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. And then we see what Jesus says. You don't desire, you don't savor the things of God. You savor the things that be of men. Satan, men. He calls him Satan and says you savor the things that be of men. That's important. It's important that you understand that. That Satan himself also savors the things that be of men if they're not the things of God. And Satan is set about using men to build his kingdom in opposition to that of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? And he's using that which looks good. And the Apostle Paul, I believe it was, told us about Satan's ministers that they come as angels of light. They present themselves as angels of light, right? The Word of God tells us that if the light that be in us be darkness, how great is that darkness? They appeal to our flesh. They appeal to our humanistic side. They appeal to the side of us that is against God. The book of Romans tells us that the carnal mind is at enmity with God. It's at war. That word enmity means war. It's fighting against the very things of God. That's still in you. You've got to understand that has not been eradicated. Unless there's one of you in here today that is perfect and you want to stand up, let us talk to you. I don't see nobody standing up. Now, some of y'all is thinking, I'm pretty close. I don't want to let y'all know about it. But there's a real enemy here, church. The world, the flesh, and the devil is real. The enemy is all fine and dandy with you exchanging the God that has set himself up above the heavens for humanism. He's real fine and he's real good with that. And we have allowed that to happen. And I'm saying we as in not specifically you or not specifically me. But the American church is guilty. That is a fact. If it's not, then I don't know what's going on in this nation. But the fact of the matter is what I believe with all of my heart is that the American church is guilty of humanism. We've allowed the world, we've allowed the devil, and we've allowed our flesh to manipulate the things of God. We've decided to see a one-sided Jesus and not a full gospel. We've decided to see a Jesus that says, I love, 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 love everybody, but yet I don't hate Esau. I love everybody, and it's all good. Kumbaya, come on. God, my father poured his wrath out on me, and it's all good. Do what you want to do. There, has to, there don't have to be a change in your life. There don't have to be nothing different about you. You can just come as you are and stay as you are. That's the Jesus of humanism that is being offered. But I'm here to tell you that that is not the Jesus of the gospel for God the Father and God the Son are one and if God hated God the Father hated Esau I'm here to tell you that Jesus the Son hated him too he hates the flesh the flesh is an offense unto him I want to finish reading these verses and I'm wrapping it up then said Jesus unto his disciples if any man will come after me let him then this is the Jesus that I'm talking about This is the Jesus that I have been serving over the last seven, eight months since he so graciously called me back out of my sin. If 
He said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Deny your humanism. Deny your presuppositions, your thoughts, your ideas of who and what you think God is. Deny what the humanistic world tells you about God. Deny what your flesh tells you about God. Deny all of those things and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Wait, what? Wait, no, but that's, but no, I'm under grace. I'm under grace and God is love and, and it's okay. And I have nothing to worry about and it's all good. I can, I, it's all good. I can, I've, I've accepted him. I believe in him. It's okay. Nothing has to change. There never has to be a difference. There shouldn't be. It doesn't matter if there's really any fruit in my life. It's okay. That's your thought. That's your idea of who you want God to be. But that's not who God says he is. So what you've done is you have not brought yourself up to God because that ain't happening. You've brought God down to you. And if you really want to see what that looks like, go read Romans chapter 1 when you get home and then look around this world or specifically around this nation and you'll begin to see why this nation is the way it is. You'll begin to see why we don't know, Brother Shelby, if grown men should get in a swimming pool and swim and compete against grown women. You'll see why we don't know. Why we have an issue with making a decision and a determination about that, not just in the world, but in the church. Because the churches are split over this very thing. Who am I to say what love is? Love is love. And if I call out their love, then they're going to call out my thing, whatever that may be. And everything's all twisted up and it's all messed up and it's because we have decided that we don't like God for who he says he is. So we've created unto ourselves a God unto like creepy crawly things, unto like the image of corruptible man. And we said you'll be our God and we'll serve you because you're really like us. And you'll let us be who and what we want to be. And because of that, the word of God says that he has turned them over to the lust of their own heart, to the filthiness and the sin and the wickedness and the desires that come from the very inside of them. Because you have decided to turn me, the living God, into what you want me to be, I will give you exactly what you want. And look around our nation and tell me that is not where we are at today. Because if you can't see it, you are blind, blind, blind. If you can't see it, it's because you don't want to see it. Or if you can't see it, it's because you got the God that you made for yourself. And you can serve him if you want but I'm not going to serve him with you. He's not my God. He can be yours. He can be the world's. He can be the church down the street. He can be the church in Houston. He can be the church wherever it's at in California. He can be whatever church God he wants to be, but he's not my God. My God is a God that says, I will not come down to where you are, but I will raise you up and build you into something that looks like me. I will cause you to walk in holiness and righteousness, and I will cause you to be set apart from the things of this world, and I will cause you, if you'll look upon the face of my son, to see the things of this world growing dimmer and dimmer as they pass away till you get to a point I've been crying out and I've been praying, Lord! Become sanctified in my life. Become set apart. Become holy to where you're way up here. And everything else, Lord, is way down here. And it's not because I'm something or anything at all for that matter. Because as the Apostle Paul said, I'm chief of sinners. I'm the worst of the worst. 
I'm the wretchedest of the wretchedest, if that can be said. I am the most sinful man that I know. And this is a fact about me. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I am loved. I am cleansed. I am washed. I am forgiven. I am sanctified. I am set apart. I am a part of the bride of Christ. And one day, Kevin, that trumpet's going to sound, and he's going to come back. He's going to split that eastern sky. And if, they, if he'll just uphold me, if he'll uphold me, Yvette, if he'll keep me in his hand, and if he'll allow his grace to flow into my heart, if he'll allow his grace to fill me, if he'll keep me, Oh, he's got to keep me because if he doesn't keep me, I'll be right back worse off than what I was before. But Lord, if you'll keep me, if you'll hold me, if you'll fill me with your grace, cause me to be what it is that you've called me to be. Let us not make him what we want. Rather, let us bow our knee, deny ourselves, Take up our cross. If someone wants to come sing something, then go ahead. We can stand. So I'm not really going to give an altar call. But I just want to encourage you today, church, because I do. I love you. You might not believe it. and You might not know it. But I know what the Lord has done in my heart. He's put a love inside of me for his people. He's put a love inside of me and a, and a desire to not see his people led astray. And I want to encourage you tonight. See Jesus for who he really is. He's a God of love, but he hates the flesh. And he wants to eradicate you of that very flesh. He is not a God that is happy with unrighteousness, with, with fornication, with filth, with any of those things. Now thank God for his grace and his mercy. And we know that, that righteousness only comes by the blood of Jesus. It only comes by grace through faith. I'm not righteous today because I didn't do something. I'm righteous today because I believed in someone. But... When you truly believe in this someone, his righteousness will fill you. It will be fulfilled inside of you, the word of God says. And he will begin to cause you to walk in holiness and righteousness. And I just want to implore you today that as we leave here, seek God. Find out who he is for yourself. Don't be led to the left or to the right by your flesh or by the world or by the devil or by some smiley preacher. Find out who God says he is because he does love you. He does love you. He loves you so much. My finishing verses were actually John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I want you to understand this as I close exactly what he did, what he gave. God gave his only begotten son so that he can pour out judgment upon him so that you would not have to be the object of his wrath. Do you understand that? He's coming back, church. Soon and very soon, he's coming back. And all of those who were found not clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and once again, this is, this is Bible, this is not John. But all of those who are not found clothed in the righteousness of Christ will become the very object of wrath. And they will meet God in his wrath. But that doesn't have to be you. Because you can meet him at Calvary. You can meet him at the cross. Allow the Spirit of God to lead you. Allow the Word of God to shape your view of God. With that said, I thank you all. Father, I just thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace, Lord. I thank you for the opportunity to, to share your word, Lord. And I ask that by your spirit you would make this word real to our hearts, Lord, that you would strengthen and guide us 
In Jesus' name, amen.